So I'm a medical geographer. Who else in this room is a medical geographer? <laughs> Any other social scientists? OK, great. Look out. I'm going to change the, the, the tone a little bit and talk, move away from our case study approach and talk a little bit about um, One Health, its concepts over time, and how we're manifesting One Health research today. Um, I'm a, a, an infectious disease advisor at the at USAID. And I just started there um, about two years ago. Um, my background has been in medical geography, sort of splitting my time between the US and Uganda for the past 10 years studying um, human-animal interactions that may underline or be some of the drivers to emerging diseases. Okay. So basically, I'm going to talk to you a bit about some key concepts. So we've heard a lot of them. I'm just going to keep saying them so you get reinforced. I think it takes seven exposures to an idea or a term for it to become knowledge. So hopefully, we'll get there today. Um, <laughs> give you a definition of One Health and a history of One Health um, over time, particularly uh, looking at Africa. Exploring why we do One Health research, which I think you've gotten some good um, meat into with the past case studies. Provide some examples and then pull out some common themes. Um, I think we're doing questions at the end, but if something's burning or if I'm missing the mark, then l let me know. So here are our key concepts slide. You've heard about zoonotic disease, diseases that move from animals to people, and that they can go the other way. In the past, those have been called anthropozoonotic, um, but that's such a mouthful that we just sort of look at zoonotic diseases, those that can move from animals to people and back. Ep endemic diseases are diseases that are constantly present, um, so they're things we have to deal with that, uh, that we're used to dealing with or we're constantly exposed to. And epidemic diseases are those that, diseases that can move into um, broader spaces, so from an en endemic you can move into an epidemic if it, if it expands beyond its normal uh, case counts and case loads. Um, I forgot to put emerging in there, too. Obviously, emerging diseases are something that we're perseverating on and thinking about a lot. The definition of emerging diseases are endemics that show up in a geographic location where they're not normally, that have uh, are recrudescent, so they have higher, uh, they're higher vir virulence than normal, or they're something that's new that we haven't seen before. One Health also calls for this uh, multi-sectoral approach. So you've heard us talk about there's been a, a lot of human health uh, emphasis. We also th need to think about the animal health side and the environmental context that bring humans and animals into the same space at the same time that may uh, translate into a spillover event. And that calls for a multi-sectoral approach. And that's where, where we kind of are today with our, um, our work on, on One Health research and also bringing an interdisciplinary component to the research side. So we're looking at human health, animal health, environmental um, science, and then I am arguing that bringing the social sciences on board is long overdue. From the research component, we're looking at epidemiology. That's our Jon Snow reference. But medical geographers also claim Jon Snow because he made what? A map. Biological sampling, that's what John Brooks was talking about quite a bit with uh, looking at the non-invasive fecal samples of, of chimps. That's a an example of biological sampling, as well as actually um, taking blood draws, swabs, smears, combing you know, the, the, the fur on your primate to get ectoparasites off or ticks. Um, spillover, that's what I'm going to talk about quite a bit. That's where a lot of the latest One Health research is focused on, and that's that sort of microsecond in space and time where a pathogen can move from one per person into another person or one animal into a human or a back. Uh, mixed methods, that's sort of the, the description of, of um, a ap research approach that brings qualitative and quantitative methods together. Qualitative methods are things like um, participant observation, open interviews, um, uh, text analysis, uh, focus group discussions, and quantitative interviews are, are surveys, um, 
looking at labs, doing some of the numbers approaches. Traditionally, these camps have been quite divided because they have different epistemologies or different, um, different beliefs about how we get to the truth. Qualitative side really emphasizes recognizing who you are as a researcher and what biases you bring to the table and using that to frame your research question and being really open about it. And the quantitative side is sort of a positivistic or that claims for objectivity, which, um, which uh, kind of has receives the weight of research dollars and the weight of, of, of visibility in the journals. So bringing them together has been sort of a, a sticky process, but it's been something that's been pushed by the funders quite a bit. Um, risk behaviors are those, those human behaviors that allow for a, a disease to move from an animal into a human, and that's where a lot of the research is now that we have sort of this broad-based knowledge about um, pathogens in, in animals and wanting to understand what types of human behaviors that occur in those changes, those ecological changes that put that, that allow for this pathogen spillover. And then upstream drivers are those ecological changes, sort of environmental and social and political and cultural context that feed into those behaviors. One Health, what is One Health? Have you guys seen this triangle before? Yeah, it's um, the, the, the effort of multiple disciplines and sectors working together with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnections between people, animals, plants, and our shared environment. We often struggle to manifest e environmental health in this space because environmental health has traditionally been looking at how um, contamination in water sources impacts human health through cancers or looking at environmental health as an environmental justice component. But the way we manifest environmental health in our, in our thinking as researchers is looking at ecological integrity and biodiversity and sort of the presumed balance of, of an environment. This is a sort of an example of endemic and emerging zoonotic diseases, sort of giving an example of how they're shared. Um, kind of past this by now. And then the, some stats on endemic and emerging zoonotic diseases. 60% um, of existing infectious diseases are zoonotic, and at least 75% of emerging infections are from animal sources. Five, five new human diseases appear every year, and three of those are animal origin. And then 80% of agents with bioterrorist potential, it's something we probably haven't talked about too much, are from animal sources. CDC has some great visuals on these. So now we're gonna, oh shoot. Okay. Um, we're gonna talk about spillover a little bit and this term refers to that, so that second. So a lot of our research, yeah, it's an animation, so it came through. This is a really beautiful photo, I think, of just showing the casual intimacy of how a lot of people live with their animals. And when we um, hear reports about how people sleep with their animals, we misinterpret it as like being in, a little bit more physically intimate with their animals, but it's actually just keeping, maybe keeping your goats in your house, in your, you know, in your compound with you because someone might steal them or the chickens are free range, so they're gonna come in and hang out in your house while you're sleeping. This is a picture of red colobus in Kibali National Park in Western Uganda. There's a research station inside this park, and so there are lots of kitchens and lots of researchers, and the red colobus always come over and want to eat pineapple or like lick the outside of the building for salt content or minerals or something. Um, but it just sort of shows that they're present all, of, all the time. Those are dishes. And these, these guys have, we've discovered about 40 new unknown viruses in them, and some from filovirus families, some from um, arenavirus, uh, paramyxoviruses, and so we're part of the, you'll hear about it later as a study on those. This is a picture of cows that are grazing right next to a national park, so sort of demonstrate the proximity between livestock and national parks and potentially wildlife, so we can bring the, the idea of zoonoses into, um, from wildlife to livestock to humans and back. There are some gorillas in Bwindi. So one of the um, 
more compelling stories. One reason that a lot of research on One Health occurs in Africa is that there are particular charismatic species that we care about. In addition to the story of HIV ideology, we also have sort of a, uh, an idea about Africa as sort of the hotbed of zoonotic diseases or emerging diseases because it's this heart of darkness and it's unknown. And, and there are also these charismatic species like gorillas, chimps that we really care about and want to preserve as, as our cousins on the planet. And so there, there was a really interesting story. In um, the late 90s, this family of gorillas in Windy contracted scabies. And it actually killed a couple of the juveniles. And scabies doesn't really kill normally. And everybody has scabies. So the wildlife vet at the time, a woman named um, Dr. Gladys Kalemazikusoka, she was working in Windy. She was the first. Um, female wildlife veterinarian in Uganda. She took the juvenile carcasses and combed them out and found that the scabies were actually human scabies. So that sort of prompted her to launch this small NGO called Conservation Through Public Health, which t carried forward the idea that in order to protect gorillas and protect wildlife, we need to also take care of the communities living around the park. The gorillas had left the park and were hanging out in people's dirty laundry, and that's how they contracted the scabies. So now they treat gorillas sort of um, through bait for scabies and other parasites. This is just a picture of um, a market and what we call bush meat, which I would like to just call meat. But I think we kind of demonize the term. Bush meat is, is so loaded with um, judgment, and we wouldn't call venison bush meat here. So why do we call rodents bush meat in Africa? And then this is another sort of beautiful picture of camels in um, northern Kenya, where Predict works. You'll hear about that next after my session. But um, there's MERS is associated with camels. And here's just a, a caretaker of camels just living side by side. So why One Health Research in Africa? This is a map that came out um, really recently. My, I stapled my papers in the wrong order. 2017, it was an updated um, version of a hotspot analysis from 2008. And the map shows, it's a heat map of emerging infectious diseases relative to reporting capacity. So what we've discovered is that emerging diseases, looking at AMR, influenza, SARS, can occur anywhere in the world, but where capacity to report and respond is lowest is kind of where we have the most concern. And that tends to be in Sub-Saharan Africa and sort of Central and Northern um, South America. This African context, again, the reason that we're focusing so much on that landscape is, that is I think, is part of um, our obsession with these charismatic species. and that South America has a lot of capacity already. We've kind of stepped away from working there as a development agency. Here's a, um, a timeline of, of the evolution of the concept of One Health. So in the late 1800s, disease ecology was um, a really common um, course of study. And it, it, it moved in parallel with anthropology as the um, British Empire was expanding across the world. So as, as the British were moving into new spaces in the tropics, particularly, they would sort of have anthropologists and geographers and disease ecologists go out as a team and assess the landscape, the culture, the people, decide how civilized they could be, what risks to their uh, colonists there could be, and, and what risks to their soldiers there could be. And so disease ecology has sort of an... Um, uh, in, infamous, not famous, but like a, an embarrassing history there as part of the cultural expansion. Then also during this time, sort of around the 1920s, the Rockefellers were really interested in disease ecology and stood up a bunch of research sites around the world to look at yellow fever and would sort of house primates um, within a tree canopy at different levels, keep them in cages, and then send kids up every day to take samples from those monkeys or to bring them back down for sampling, take them back up. And so just to underline the fact that this work has been going on for 100 years and, um, and is interesting, and there's some really cool pictures associated with that. 
Medical Geography came on in the in around 1948 with Jock May. He was a, a U.S. surgeon and general, and he created wrote up the first um, atlas of infectious disease. And ge medical geography sort of hit the ground, and that with that atlas, it evolved into also being um, the science of of the distribution of medical services as well. It's really been focused on infectious diseases, sort of grown into looking at um, non-communicable diseases and the distribution of those across space. Thinking about how the environment uh, and humans' interaction with the environment enables those um, non-communicable infectious disease and then where to put your health services in relation to those illnesses. One medicine is the... Mm, so it's sort of the, the, the world of, of the vet sector. It's kind of Carl Schwab was a veterinarian and in 1964 coined the term in his text of about how the human health and animal health professionals needed to work together because health was so interconnected. So he was kind of ahead of the curve on his, um, his vision. EcoHealth came along in the 1990s as part of the... Um, theories about the origins of HIV were coming to bear and understanding, trying to understand the relationship between healthy ecological systems and healthy humans. And EcoHealth held on for a while, um, but kind of petered out in favor of One Health. So around in 2001, Beatrice Hahn's lab is the lab that, that confirmed that HIV was from, that HIV-1 was a product of human and animal contact, particularly chimps. And that gave the, the, the conservation community and the veterinary community a lot of leverage and argument and justification to get their, their agenda, so to speak, or their priorities on the table with the human health sector. And that sort of evolved with WC, Wildlife Conservation Society taking that on and creating the concept of One World, One Health, which then evolved into One Health in 2010, codified through um, sort of a WHO, OIE, FAO. Um, sort of a UN body um, agreement that One Health should be the way forward. Some people think that what's next is planetary health. Sounds kind of awesome and far out. That's a movement that's coming out of um, Harvard with some Rockefeller funding, so there may be something to it. Just keep your eyes out for that. So now we'll move into the fun stuff, some examples of One Health research in, in Africa. And one thing that this timeline uh, sort of lies about is the assumption that these, m these moments, these principles are finished. But actually, eco-health studies are continuing, medical geography continues, disease ecology continues, particularly with those research um, programs and bats with, I mean, in caves with bats and sort of doing that ecological sampling. Um, so I'm going to suggest that One Health research going forward have a broader social science element so that we can start doing something about the knowledge that we have. The first project here is the Kibali EcoHealth Project. It's based out of University of Wisconsin, and Tony Goldberg is the PI. And I'm particularly fond of this project slash have emotional feelings about it because it's where I cut my teeth. So um, I'm really biased in both ways. Sometimes I hate it, sometimes I love it. <laughs> and uh, this is a male red colobus and this um, map here is a map of where humans, it's, a, it's, a hum it's an activity space mapping. So the different colors represent different places where people are, red, yellow, and orange represents different sort of intensities of utility of that location, and the, the blue tones are the primates, different intensities of primates in those locations. So we did a spatial analysis to see where humans and, and primates overlap the most, and it's right at the edge of this fragment, so that, that uh, shape in the middle is a forest fragment. There are these forest patches that, live, that sort of persist outside of national parks where some primates live, and so that, those are the primates that have most contact with people. And they're coming out, hanging out right on the edge of that fragment. And if you take a deeper dive into what's going on there, there's a water source that people and primates both use. The idea behind that project is to look at the roots, biological and social drivers, 
and they're really interested in taking this One Health approach, but they called it EcoHealth because it was, took off in 2005, sort of before the One Health concept got one, basically one out. <laughs> it comes from a decidedly conservation background. The Dynamic Drivers of Disease in Africa was a really neat um, consortium project out of Sussex. The PI is Melissa Leach. It lasted from 2011 to 2016, and it pulled from 21 institutions across the US, Africa, and, um, but primarily in the UK. The, they studied four zoonotic diseases, so some of these classic um, zoonotic diseases that we think about on the continent, loss of fever in Sierra Leone, Hanipa virus in Ghana, Rift Valley fever in Kenya, and trypanosomiasis in Zambia and Zimbabwe. And they were looking at the different ways that ecosystem changes, so it's really bringing the, the environmental component of One Health to the, to the fore, and how those ecosystem changes impacted people's livelihoods and how that impacted how they interacted with animals. And this is an opportunity here and th with this consortium to really bring in the livestock sector because livestock have been kind of neglected by One Health in Africa because we're so interested in wildlife. This is a picture of Accra and the bats come out right around um, dusk in just in the heart of the city. It's right next to where the, um, the army base in the city is. This is a really new study. It started in 2013, a multidisciplinary study of humans, great apes, and diseases in equatorial Africa. And she's naming it Social Science Perspectives on Cross-Species Contacts. And Tamara giles Vernick is an environmental historian um, based at Institute Pasteur. And she writes about the human and chimpanzee relationships in southeastern Cameroon. And wants to disrupt the notion that they're these one-off events, but sort of bringing to, to, this, to the narrative instead a constellation of events. So for example, chimpanzees have a particularly spiritual position in a lot of rural communities in, in Cameroon, and so they're, they're often overlapping. They'll, they do hunt um, chimps, and, and when a chimp dies, they'll naturally they'll, cut, they'll prepare it for their animals, for their dogs to eat. So there is opportunity for spillover there, but it's more nuanced than just this question of hunting. Um, she has virologists on her team, she has social scientists, she has microbiologists, um, a really robust interdisciplinary team. They're really, they've, they've sort of taken a deep dive into the notion of contact and trying to think about contact as more than hunting or as more than overlap, but understanding how that's changed over time as well to inform the story of risk. Here's when we're going back to the hunting story, hunting for health, biocultural drivers of bushmeat hunting. It's funded by the State Department, so she had to use bushmeat. <laughs> um, Sagan Fryant is at Penn State, and she's looking at the biocultural drivers and has done some interesting work, actually spending time in, in hunting huts in the forest with the hunters, and she's one of the first people who sort of discovered or reported out that it wasn't just men in the hunting huts in the forest, but women are actually there keep, keeping people company and keeping the hut um, hospitable and also preparing the animals as they go, they sort of make their way into the market. She um, is focused on Cross River State, which is a very rapidly changing uh, environment in, in southeastern um, Nigeria. And there was a plan just recently to have a major highway move through that part of Nigeria, which was going to go right through the heart of the park. And this dis sort of, um, I forget what that word is, make everybody move who lives in this particular zone. Like people are actually allowed to live inside the park and sort of maintain lifestyles. Um, and this, this road was going to go right through it. And people got together, advocated to move the road, and they were successful. So they move the road, which means she needs to think of a new research project because the environment's not going to change the way she expected. <laughs> and here's um, um, my project that I've been working on for the past couple years, and it's based off of that 10 years of Kibali EcoHealth research. And what we discovered in that research was there's this whole plethora of new potentially pathogenic viruses in primates. Um, baboons, surprisingly, aren't full of 
viruses, even though they're in everybody's face and yards and crops, and they're full of like ticks and gross things, but they just don't seem to be co-infected with, with these new viruses. And we also, in that study with the map, discovered that, that human-animal overlap and contact was related to subsistence farming. And so in order to affect behavior change, we needed to take into account these structural issues of farming. And so we um, used this idea of human-centered design that comes from the marketing background. So human-centered design takes this very empathetic, investigatory approach into, and, and will bring together a team from the, your clients. Um, it was used by Apple and like, silico, it's very Silicon Valley. Um, and so pulling together your, your users and exploring with them what their priorities are and how to motivate change and what, where, where people envision their locus of, of, or agency, sort of the locus of change internally or externally and some of the hierarchical challenges associated with that change. And try to understand if they cared at all about zoonotic disease. And then they, their very high awareness of, of brucellosis or of Ebola, swine flu, whatever, like 98% are completely aware of this zoonotic disease risk, but needed to get firewood, get water, get the kids to school, grow crops, so it's not really of high concern. So what we try to do is unpack what their concerns are and unpack what we've discovered from the research and blend them and create some just communication materials to start out with. And this picture at the top is a drama show with um, Edith, my field assistant there, and her mom sort of enacting what you could, what it could look like or feel like if you contracted um, an influenza from um, a pig, your pig, or a wild pig. And then this brochure at the bottom is what the, the team came up with in terms of communicating in local languages and, and using like the, the villagers who drew, who were there to draw out the pictures. And they also sort of created diagrams on the inside to make suggestions based on some interaction with the envi environmental officers on where you should put your pigs in relation to your house and your goats and what the distance should be and where should your latrine be. And, and also got access to a bunch of free trees and tree seedlings to use as firewood instead of needing to go into the forest to access those. And so we're just set, testing how effective that was right now. I just got back from Uganda yesterday and got some started getting the data from this three-year study, just sort of looking at the same people over time to see if this made a difference. And I don't really expect it to, but I think it's going to be really interesting anyways. <laughs> and this last piece is um, PREDICT. PREDICT is a very large global project. Um, it's funded by USAID, and it's had two iterations. It's on its second iteration. Sort of fundamental piece is that they're sampling wildlife, particularly non-human primates, bats, and rodents, and also looking at humans and sampling humans who are showing up at facilities with fevers of unknown origin that are not malaria, and sampling those, biological sampling of humans, and also using questionnaires to, to understand what types of contact those people have had with animals, livestock, or wildlife. And then also compared with that in this PREDICT2 is a behavioral component, including the mixed methods approach that I was describing before with focus groups um, and interviews, along with knowledge attitude practice surveys. They've, their sort of band-aid is to build capacity in the countries where they're working. So this is just some stats on, on how successful they've been over the past four years to train up um, government physicians and technicians to do investigations and even to do these mixed method pieces. Sampled over 40,000 animals and people working in 60 countries and have detected more than 1,000 unique viruses. Okay, and even known viruses, 182 known viruses in their samples. So I'm not gonna go t like into this too far because your next piece will give you a really great case study there. So some common themes about One Health research in Africa, it's, it's epitomized by these multiple disciplines working together. So One Health is that concept of a tripod, human health, animal health, and environmental components. So you think of it as a tripod. They're working together to support this platform of research and understanding. 
for focusing on the intersections of human and animal contact in changing in landscapes and the health effects of the, that context. So not just the how do people interact with animals, but what are the impacts of that interaction? In Africa, the tendency is to focus on the wildlife component and the emerging diseases component. It's where we get a lot of traction, a lot of funding. And then human-animal contact is inextricable from your, the livelihood elements. So we need to understand those structural and political economic factors that are underneath. Those are the drivers of contact. Also, all my examples have PIs from wealthy countries. So I want to start problematizing that going forward and have having people who start, I want to like find those research projects by that are led by PIs from the countries that we're studying, not just from outsiders. I've got a couple suggestions for reading going forward. Of course, I have to plug health and medical geography. This Ebola culture and politics book by Barry and Bonnie Hewlett is really, really interesting. He, Barry Hewlett was the first anthropologist to accompany um, an Ebola research team. WHO called him up. And he's been kind of left behind. I haven't seen much from him from this last Ebola outbreak, but it's a really, really compelling just piece about him. Eco-health research and practice. So it carries forward some more of these examples of research. And then One Health, the science and politics of One Health research in Africa, take, walks you through some of those dynamic drivers of disease consortium case studies with a very critical political lens. That's it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>